We always say it starts with the foundation. It doesn't need to, but ideally it might start with the foundation. So this is you going through Periop 101, learning what's sterile, what isn't, how many inches do I stay away? You know, how much time does this need to cook to get sterile? What are safe positioning? What are the rules of our profession? What are some of those, you know, what is it like to take the consent form? It, this is all the background knowledge that's needed. So it's got to start there because you can't call something out if you don't know yourself what's gone awry. Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now it's time to roll back and start the first case. Today, Melanie and I are going to be speaking with Danielle Quintana, assistant professor at the University of Houston Gessner College of nursing, and we're going to be introducing a concept to you today, maybe one that you're inherently aware of, but haven't well defined for yourself in the past. We're going to get some tools. We've even got bonus content for you related to this episode. Danielle is going to talk to us about surgical conscience, Melanie. I am so excited to actually have a conversation about this topic. Danielle and I met in person at the AORN Expo earlier this year, and she was talking to me about her research and about surgical conscience. And I was already planning out all of our episodes and season ideas and Knowing that we were going to be talking about infection prevention, I was like, oh, we have to talk to you. Can we? Can you please come on the podcast and talk about this topic? Because it's so important. And then also actually having a definition for what surgical conscience is. It's just, I'm really excited for her to share her research and all of the information she has with us. We'll be right back with Danielle Quintana. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Justin Poulin. From the studios of Healthcare HQ, you're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Danielle Quintana, Assistant Professor at the University of Houston Gessner College of Nursing. And in this season of infection prevention, we are going to be talking about surgical conscience. And so, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you both. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I see you've got some good equipment for recording a podcast. Your audio is going to come through loud and clear. Did you need that just in your role as an assistant professor, like just to help with lectures, et cetera? We did. When the pandemic came, we went from face-to-face to Zoom in less than a week. So the first thing we all got were these headphones. This this is my headphone from the pandemic still. <laughs> so it got a lot of use, but now we're kind of used to using it. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your role? Obviously, it had to change and like so many of us pivot during that time. But what are you responsible for? What kind of students are you working with specifically? Or is it very broad, you know, for all different levels of, you know, students that are getting their nursing degree? Well, for the most part, I do focus on the undergraduate student. And I teach in a special program. It's an accelerated second degree program. So those students, they have a baccalaureate degree and whatever. It could be anything from teaching to exercise to architecture, whatever it could be. And then in less than one year, they are with us through our program and they get their BSNs and they sit for the NCLEX. So it's a super fast, it's the same amount of hours as a two and a half year program, but it's condensed down into a 12 month period. So that's where I spend most of the time. And I'm excited because we do have an OR class in that curriculum and not all colleges do. So that's why I've been here for 10 years, because that course really keeps me excited every year. Can you talk a little bit about your OR experience? 
experience and your history in the operating room? I'd love to, Melanie. So I'm kind of looking at a 20 plus year OR career. I was a surgical tech first and then got my RN, my BSN. And so I went, my residency was surgical tech on Friday, OR nurse on Monday. And oh, nice. That, and that's how that looked. <laughs> it was like, here, we're on the chart. You're good now. Trial by fire. Here you go. <laughs> but I've loved the OR. I've, you know, all this time in the OR, I've I did a lot of neuro, pediatric neuro cases. And so that's where my real love was. And then about 10 years ago, I came into teaching full time. But like I said, still get to do the OR um, by teaching new undergrads what the OR career could be like. And, I, and we all know how important that is. So that's a highlight of my year. Oh, yeah. And I'm so jealous that you're able to give nursing students an insight into the operating room because my my intro to the operating room in nursing school was one day. Um, it wasn't exactly the in-depth experience that a lot of nursing students are getting today. And I realize every nursing student still is not getting that opportunity. But for the ones that are, they are really, I'm very thankful that we are exposing nursing students to the operating room. So as we have our conversation today, we're actually going to be talking about surgical conscience, which is also a great thing that people should be introduced to early on. But I wasn't. I didn't hear that term until I had been in the OR for a while. But what about you? What's your story with surgical conscience? How did you hear about this term? For me, you know, it's a funny story. Nearly 30 years ago, you know, I was about 16 years old and I was a volunteer at a hospital. And so my parents used to drive me to the hospital and I would put on the candy striper outfit. And I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it literally has red and white (laughs) pinstripes on it. And I was very proud to wear that as a 16 year old. And my job was to deliver needles and syringes to all the units in the hospital. Nowadays, you know, we need a needle, we grab it, we use it. But back then we had to count everything. And that was my job. And so the last stop of the day for me was the OR. And so I got to change into the bunny suit and go inside the OR. And of course, like any 16 year, I was blown away by what they were doing in the OR. And the nurses befriended me and saw how interested I was in the OR. And I remember asking them one day, you know, everyone knows what they're doing and nobody's talking. How do y'all do this? And she's like, oh, sweetie, they're all just using their surgical conscience. And I just remember being, you know, blown away by what that might mean and what that all was. And fast forward, I've been on this journey chasing surgical conscience ever since for 30 years, up until, you know, getting my PhD and really trying to study this concept and really just seeing if I could put some grit behind what all of this is and not make it so anecdotal, you know, and just try to get my hand around what this concept is and what it means to us. Well, my first exposure to surgical conscience was actually standing by the board in our department and an RNFA came running down the hall mad as anything about something that had gone wrong in the room. And all she could say was, they just don't have a surgical conscience. They, I just don't understand. And she was just ranting and raving about this particular person's lack of a surgical conscience. And I'm going... I've never heard that word. What is she talking about? Now, obviously, context clues and being able to figure things out, I could kind of figure out what she was talking about. But like me, everybody might not have heard that term from the beginning. So why don't we go ahead and define it so that we can start with that for everybody to understand even the basics of what it is? Well, yeah, I think, you know, I I can confidently say to you, we've got a definition now secured. (laughs) And and that was one of the problems. It's so anecdotal. You know, it's like, oh, it's the golden rule or, oh, it's do the right thing when no one's watching. It's all these things. But I was able to get this published in the ARN journal. And basically, we know surgical conscious supports positive patient outcomes, incorporating knowledge of aseptic technique, infection control and safety. When we uphold it, we're using our ethical and moral decision-making practices, and it involves an obligation to speak or act with professional moral courage, all to benefit the surgical patient. So in a nutshell, these are the things that we know and the things we believe and ultimately the things we do to keep patients safe in the operating room. I like that. That that is very short and sweet, but it does make sense of the larger definition. But so let's think about there's a human factor, obviously, when it comes to surgical conscience. Can we can you dive into that human factor part of it for us? Yeah. And Melanie, that's why I'm so excited that you have this content in the series that you're doing on this, because when we think infection control and safety, we think of the guidelines, the protocols. We've got so many of those. We're so lucky that we have all of these protocols helping us keep people safe. But I came across this one researcher. Her name is 
Dr. Berlinger, and she studies ethics in healthcare. And it just rang true to me when she said, these guidelines and these protocols are only as good as the people who use them. So there is a human choice here. We are human beings after all, right? And so I think where a lot of the research needs to go with this is more about that human factor in all of this. People decide to use protocols. People have to feel safe to use a protocol. People have to feel empowered to want to use a protocol. So safety is not just the protocols themselves, obviously. People keep people safe. And surgical conscious plays a huge part in that. Wow. That is, you don't think about all the, it's almost like an onion, you know, you don't think about all the different layers that go into that, but it's true. There's a human factor, not just in surgical conscience, but in infection prevention in general, in the things that we do in the operating room, the guidelines aren't, they're only as good as, as we make them. They're only as good as we enforce them and as we follow them. So that is just, a, it's very fundamental, but at the same time, oh yeah, that's just a very eye-opening way of looking at it at the same time. So, Danielle, I think one of the things about that definition is it's also very broad and all-encompassing. And so I can see why people previously to having a definition might just be like, oh, you know, I'm not totally sure I know what that means. But one thing that really sticks out to me is that while some of it might be very fundamental to what we do, another component of this is very much like what you said about ethics, and there's some philosophy that is built into that. And I'm really wondering about how you feel, especially with, you know, kind of that K to K through 12, not focusing as much on philosophy. And then all of a sudden you have these students that are coming in and it's a source of pride for you and this, you know, your work to be focused on surgical conscience. Do you feel like the students that are coming in without any of that, sort of liberal arts philosophy conversations happening in the K through 12, do they, does this require a little extra effort to sort of build that ethics base? Not because they're not good people or anything like that, but just to give it some construct, it's almost like you need that philosophy background to get into those kinds of conversations at a deep level so that it has meaning. Absolutely. You know, and Justin, it's true for all of nursing in general. We're expecting nurses to, you know, abide by the code of ethics and whatnot. But this does require a personal moral obligation to do so. And you're right. People are coming in with all different backgrounds and all different, you know, ideologies about things. And we're, we're literally asking in this model for you to have a sense of duty and feel that you do have to act for the benefit of somebody else. That piece, if we don't have that piece in surgical conscience, we don't have it at all. Because if you think about it, Justin, you have to know what's sterile, what's not sterile, what's safe. That's your foundation. But you have to feel a duty or a compelling reason to act and then take that action. If you don't feel the duty or the moral obligation, you don't you Or do how not easily act. are you compromised so, when there's time pressures or management pressures, like there's all these other things that wind up coming into play when you're not in the ideal world anymore. And again, that moral compass, a lot of that comes from being able to have a lot of discussions in the gray area realm so that you're capable of, and really it's critical thinking, it's the basis of critical thinking. Um, but that moral compass, I can just see where Again, not that anybody's doing anything malicious or they're coming in with, you know, anything but good intentions. But I just think sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than simply saying, oh, you've got a moral duty or you've got an ethical duty. You know, to really attribute meaning does require a lot of conversation and, and in the weeds, as they say. You're right. And, you know, sometimes, Justin, we can look at it the opposite way. When we look at why people don't stay in the OR or whatnot, you know, why they don't make it to their two-year anniversary, some of the research tells us it's they have moral residue. They've got some guilt. They, they're they not able to act when they want it to. And so sometimes we can get ahead of that by saying we want to act with this moral courage that we have, not only for the patient, but for us, too. If we come home every day and we didn't get to do what we needed to do or felt that we needed to do, that weighs on us. And over time, that residue can take us out of the OR, can take us out of nursing. So that's another way of looking at it for some of our, you know, I don't want to say newer generation, but it's also it also benefits you in your career to do what needs to be done and not carry around this, this unnecessary burden. 
So, you know, I think part of the reason that I wanted to go, you know, in that direction with the conversation is because I know we're going to like really start to define what surgical conscience is, not so much with the definition, but let's start teasing out what are some components of surgical conscience? What, is, what are the implications? How, how do you give this meaningful construct to students? And so let's start with that basis. What are, what are three components that you can lay out for us to really help break that down, especially where you've built a curriculum around this? Absolutely. So, you know, we always say it starts with the foundation. It doesn't need to, but ideally it might start with the foundation. So this is you going through Periop 101, learning what's sterile, what isn't, how many inches do I stay away? You know, how much time does this need to cook to get sterile? What are safe positioning? What are the rules of our profession? What are some of those, you know, what is it like to take the consent form? It, this is all the background knowledge that's needed. So it's got to start there because you can't call something out if you don't know yourself what's gone awry, right? So it's got to, it technically should start there. The middle component, required attributes, these are those things like my morals, my ethics, my obligation. Am I responsible here? You could have something get contaminated, but you just don't think you're responsible for doing anything about it. So no action takes place. So I've got to feel a sense of obligation, responsibility. And in order to do that, I have to be aware. And people don't like this part because awareness, you know, awareness of others can sometimes be, you know, I'm policing somebody now. You know, I'm, I'm not just responsible for me. Now I'm responsible for you, the surgeon. And, you know, it, it starts to pile up. So that's that middle part right there. Third part is the action, because if you follow the model along, okay, now I know what's sterile, I know what's safe, I'm compelled to act, but I do nothing. And there are tons of reasons why sometimes people don't act, and that's all the barriers that we'll probably discuss later. But for whatever reason, a barrier is in the way of either you speaking up or you acting. And that action part is so critical, because that is what the life-saving part of the model is. It's the part where you stop the line, you raised your hand, you you put yourself in front of the patient sometimes, right? It's it can be very physical. And so that action part is is the final but most important part of the model. Well, absolutely, because that's where it actually, you know, rubber meets the road, so to speak, is where we it actually in, compels us to act or to not act. Um, but you mentioned barriers, and I'm curious, what barriers have you seen that actually, I mean, I can think in my own practice, things like just being busy, or maybe just being afraid of a surgeon or afraid of getting called out. So I know that there are barriers to doing the right thing sometimes. What barriers have you seen? Well, you know, you're on all of those lines, Lonnie, and you know this really well. In, in some of the research I did, it was something like 90.3% of the nurses I studied agree. There were times in the OR they've spoken up and they face resistance from others. So if I don't believe that my speaking up, another way to put this is I think I will be in danger if I speak up. And that is in the form of possibly a retaliation. I know you've spoken on the show about, you know, a sabotage or, you know, something's going to get. So safety, psychological safety is sometimes at risk and why people feel they're not able to speak up. It's a barrier. Just yeah, I spoke. I well, yeah, I spoke up just recently, actually, in a procedure because something was going on that wasn't right, and we needed to do it a different way. And I took flack from the person who was scrubbed in and from the surgeon. And I'm standing there going, "But, but this isn't the way it's supposed to be." And then I'm the one taking all the heat for it. And I, that's just not right. And then you you carry that, and it's heavy, and it's. Like, is it worth saying anything? Is it worth speaking up if I'm going to take the heat for for saying anything? Then I'm it's like I'm the wrong person or something. So it, it's 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 a hard burden to bear sometimes. Absolutely, and you know the the safety comes into institutional safety. What is the culture of safety like here? What is it like to report an error where I work? Is are we in a just culture or are we in a place where errors are punitive and penalized and People know this already. You are not going to have people reporting errors if they don't feel safe to do so. So we, we know all these pieces already, but they come right here in this model for all the reasons why people don't, you know, why people can't speak up when they need to. All right. So you developed a tool that I'm curious to talk about, a surgical conscience tool, I'm assuming. 
<laughs> yeah. So part of the dissertation, a big the goal of the dissertation was to walk away with some kind of scale that we could use to say, what is my surgical conscious level right now? So where am I in time with all of this? And so that's what I set out to do. In the process of doing this, two tools emerged. One is a surgical conscience scale that can help us figure out what that level is. But I got so involved in the barriers, a barriers tool emerged too, where we could, it's short and sweet, but it tells me there are some barriers stopping you from using your surgical conscience to its fullest. And here's what they might be. And that's really important too, because that helps us go back and say, okay, it is a, it is a reporting error here, or it is a policy that needs to be in place in my department to help me. So two scales came out of the work that I did. And I'm excited about it because I feel like we really can't intervene and make our surgical conscious any stronger, or we can't intervene and get barriers out of the way if we don't have something numeric to, you know, we need a baseline. And so these tools can help us with that baseline. So how do you employ these tools? Do you give them out to all staff, kind of aggregate the results and then create some next steps to maybe continue to enhance their surgical conscience based on based on those results? Or are they really meant to be more of a, a tool one-on-one, like maybe in, you know, your employment review, or maybe you're intending to use that in all in all those cases? Right. Justin, like the the tool has its ability to do either. It could be it's made in such a way where you can sit down, take the scale yourself, see where you are. But really, it was meant to, you know, let's say there have been a series of infections in the department, right? We've got a spike in infections. Let's deploy the tool, see where some of the issues might be, and then let's have some in-service and training and education, and then use the tool again to see, did we improve, you know, or hopefully did we improve? But it it was really thought of to be used, you know, for the individual, but really for, you know, the department as a whole can benefit from using the, using the tool. So Danielle, one of the nice things is you provided us a model on surgical conscience so that again, to help everyone conceptualize what we're talking about here, and we're going to make it available as bonus content for anybody who's downloaded the first case smartphone app for iPhone or Android. And so maybe just as maybe people are already listening on the app and they're like, oh, there's bonus content. And they click on the on the gift box in the episode <laughs> and they're looking at it while we continue to talk right now. Can you walk people through this model? Absolutely. You know, we discuss the dimensions of the model, the three dimensions, but one thing that I love about the model that you really can't see by just looking at it is this is a circular model. So what that means to us is your surgical conscience is regenerative. Each and every time you have an opportunity to use your surgical conscience, it strengthens, right? You, you walk away with a lot of courage after doing something very difficult, and that just gives you the force to enable you to do that again. And so we love that there's momentum behind this. Another thing that you might not seen the model because it's not shown exactly in this particular version of the model. But think about the power of us all using our surgical conscious at the same time. So we all have one. The nurse, the surgical technologist, anesthesia, the surgeon, if we're all using this model to the best of our ability, the benefit for the patient is exponential, right? So just think of all of these mini surgical consciences in the whole entire room working on, you know, behalf of the patient. It's, it's so powerful in my mind. Absolutely. So we have this model. You have developed these this these tools that are going to be available soon, but there are ways that we can educate our staff and we can empower our staff to feel comfortable taking action when they need to. What are some ways we can do that? Melanie, you know, it can start with the individual, right? I always say there's a micro, miso, and macro to this. It starts with you first. Get in touch with this concept. Look at the model. Get in touch with the, the, the dimensions of this model. And what I say to you first is, so what does it mean to me? What does it mean to me in my practice? One of the things that we know is that you're going to be faced with challenges. And I don't want to say on a daily basis, but I'm not that far off, right? You know it's coming. So we'd love to use cognitive rehearsal to help us get better with surgical conscience. And what that means is I'm practicing ahead for when things are about to be tough. So let's say you know there's there might be a surgeon that you're asking to do the timeout and you can't get that room to be quiet during that moment. You could practice what you might say before that moment comes and put that in your toolbox. That way, when the moment comes, you'll have something there ready to go. It's not a surprise that you're going to be challenged. So to get ahead of that, 
you want to practice for some of these really difficult scenarios. What would I say if, or what would I do if? And that's where it starts with you first. We move out. Miso, it means, how is my department doing with this? Are there policies in place that say, if I raise my hand, I will be supported? And, you know, Melanie, we were at the expo, and I know you were there, and someone came up to us after I did a podium presentation on this, and they said, I'm so glad you mentioned this. I work with the surgeon, and the policy when we work with that surgeon is, we don't count at the end of the case. He doesn't have the time. We take a mandatory x-ray every time. And the first thing I said was, you just said it was policy. Are you sure it's written in your policy that you do that? And they're like, um, actually, no, you're right. It's not policy. So policy protects us, right, big time. And so your policy says you count for your cases. There's got to be some backup here for those times when someone wants to disregard the policy. We cannot be policing, right? We have to be strong and have ethics and have our obligation, but we're not policing. We have to be backed up by the policy to do the job that we're here to do. Yes, absolutely. So, and then we moving on out from there, there's also macro. What does macro involve? Macro means, you know, we should not have to pick up our, our OR manuals and our, our workbooks and look to find where surgical conscience is, right? We, we need this work. We need research. We need more work on this. We want this to be something, you know, it's no longer anecdotal. We know how important this is. And so we want to have other people researching the topic too. And we want to use these tools and see how they're doing. And more research is needed to make sure we're giving this our fullest attention. We know how important it is. I talk to so many OR nurses that tell me, yes, I, I know this. This is my this is my motto. This is my mantra. Well, then we need to see this in the research. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely we do. And the more we see it researched and the more information that comes out, the more empowering it'll be, I think, to just improve our practice. But that actually leads me to the whole topic of this season is infection prevention. And if we take the idea of surgical conscience and we look at infection prevention, I think we can connect the dots pretty easily, but I'm going to let you do it anyway. Connecting the dots from surgical conscience to infection prevention, how does that go? What does that look like? This looks like, you know, it. we say, why me? Why me? This is why not you. No better person in the OR is equipped to protect the patient like we are. We know the foundation. We have our obligation there. We are in position to act. We know the guidelines and protocols. We're the perfect, you know, there's a human factor in this. We're the perfect human to be able to do this, right? And so for me, there's a direct connection between outcomes, surgical infections and retained foreign bodies with this human element of purposely using my surgical conscience to help me keep patients safe. It's For me, it's a direct line. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it is a very, very straight line from one to the other. And we just need to feel empowered to stand up and to do the right thing. Well, I mean, a major component is the fundamentals. And, you know, the fundamentals are infection prevention. Everything that we learn from hand washing to aseptic technique and maintaining a sterile field, it's all related to infection prevention. So that fundamentals piece and, and again, you know, really anchoring on this surgical conscience is really about maintaining the integrity you know, of the way we do our jobs to make sure that patients don't go home with something that they didn't come in with. Danielle, really great job in this interview and great work at the university. I will say having a program that does highlight the operating room is so key. I know Melanie mentioned it at the very beginning, but we've talked about it many times on the show in the past. I observed one one-hour surgery as a matter of practice. I happened to do a senior preceptorship that exposed me to a few additional surgeries, but it was a very unique and first-time placement in my preceptorship, so it definitely wasn't standard. And I think many people were almost coming out of nursing school a little intimidated by the operating room as a result. So great job in structuring your program um, to make that seem maybe a little less intimidating to people who are new in their nursing careers. I agree. I We know how important it is to get people behind that red line. And so I'm thrilled that our college supports perioperative nursing the way it does. It's it's a huge part of why I've been here for 10 years. Excellent. Well, Danielle, I just congratulated the great work that the college is doing, but also I think 
what you brought to the table to our audience today. Absolutely fantastic. And there may be plenty of people who have seen your tenure, but haven't really, you know, thought about this concept of the surgical conscience, even if they have a very strong one. I think bringing it into that forefront and that conscious mind, a <laughs> little play on words there, uh, is, is always important. And it can help reinforce surgical conscience to others that we work with on a day in and day out basis. So great job today. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for having me. It's been a dream to come on and get to speak about my most favorite topic in the world. And I'm so excited for anyone who will be listening to it. That was Danielle Quintana, assistant professor at the University of Houston Gessner College of Nursing. And Melanie, I'll be honest with you, I have never heard of this concept of the surgical conscience. And I think sometimes you just get so far along in your career, it feels like this is second nature or it's an expectation that you might have of yourself and the others that you you work with on a day in and day out basis. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think I've ever put a construct to this concept. I think we all innately know the idea of it, but to really explore it, to really reinforce it and you know, as I mentioned before, you know, in talking with Danielle, I feel like a lot of those gray area conversations, there's just not a lot of them happening even as you, you know, get into your collegiate life. And and that's where I got my first philosophy class and started to think about ethics and moral compass. And so obviously we all want to do good things if we get into nursing, but I think having a construct for that is really important. And I do want to remind everybody if you go to this episode because you've downloaded the First Case smartphone app for iPhone or Android, just click on the episode, click the gift box, and you'll be able to look at the model that Danielle shared with us. I think that model is super helpful. And I think, like you said, it's very helpful to have a construct for this term because I'm familiar with the term. I didn't get introduced to it when I came into the OR, but I heard it. And then my understanding of it was, well, it's doing the right thing when you're in surgery. That's kind of the conclusion I drew. And she was right about it being very anecdotal. And it's just people kind of understood what it was, but it was kind of this fluid idea. So to put it into words and to actually define what surgical conscience is and to provide a construct that we can operate off of is so helpful, not only for our own practice, but also as it connects to things like infection prevention. How is what we're doing and doing the right thing affecting our patients down the line? It's very helpful. And I think she's done a fantastic job putting this stuff into words for us. Yeah. Great interview with Danielle today. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to First Case on your favorite podcast app or by downloading the smartphone app on iPhone or Android. Simply search for First Case in the App Store or Google Play. The best thing about downloading the smartphone app is that you can access bonus content for certain episodes and view episodes in certain categories, like articles on the go and vendor spotlights. Are you following us on LinkedIn or Facebook yet? If you are and you love an episode or post, then let your social network know about it. Like, comment, or share our posts along with your thoughts and keep the conversation going. If you have any topics or guests that you would like to recommend for a future episode, just send us an email to info at firstcasemedia.com. We look forward to hearing from you. 